A little background of DPA is um, we came from a working relationship with um, a measurement instrument manufacturer called uh, Boylan Care. They are doing very, very fine measurement instrument for sound, for vibration, for wind, for moisture, for humidity, for whatever you want to measure, but also, obviously, microphones. Back in the days, these microphones, they were used for measurement only, but a few guys from, from the uh, technology team there, they were looking at these microphones and said, what do they sound like, these measurement microphones? They were interested in hearing them, so they took them home and they started recording stuff at home. One of the, uh, one of the guys, the engineer, he was recording his wife's choir. She was singing uh, at a choir um, every now and then, and he put up two of these measurement microphones and, and recorded that on, onto tape deck, reel to reel. You know what that is? Yeah, okay. Um, that was back in the days. And um, they kind of, they, they liked what they heard. So they took these, micro these measurement microphones to Danish Broadcasting and said, um, would you like to hear these microphones? Would you like to be involved in a, in a project where we turn these measurement microphones into something we can use in the audio industry? And they looked at the microphones, yeah, what happens to them when we drop it in beer? They said, back then, all sound engineers, they were drinking beer at work, especially in Danish Broadcasting. But, um, and the uh, engineer, he took the microphone, the measurement microphone, dropped it into, into the beer because obviously they were drinking beer at the meeting. And he stirred it and, sh and he was shaking it and he was talking into it. Sold, they said. So it worked. It worked on the very, very extreme conditions. And that started the adventure of um, making these me measurement microphones into something that we could use in our industry. Back, in, back when they started it, the mi measurement microphone, they were powered by 130 volts. Uh, the connectors were BNC connectors, uh, not very suitable for our industry. So they changed the preamp. The capsule is the key to all this. Um, but the preamp they changed into something that could be run uh, on 48 volts phantom power and changed the, to the XLR connector and balanced it and, and so on. So it fitted into the normal setup that we have. That went really well for a few years and then recession came and the uh, Boylan Care um, had to shut down uh, the microphone business. It didn't go that well, so they couldn't, they, they, it, they couldn't, um, um, it couldn't lift its own um, expenses, so they had to let, it, let the people go. And the people from Brilliant Care that were doing all these uh, stuff with the microphones, they started their own company, and they, that was called DPA Microphones. It was actually called Danish Pro Audio, supplier of Brilliant Care microphones. That was a bit too long, so they shortened it after a few years into uh, DPA Microphones. It changed the logo a few times on the way, but the capsule is still the same. It is an omni capsule. It is a pressure capsule. It's a measurement capsule. And that's going to be like the headline for everything that we do today uh, in this workshop. It is the reference microphone. It is a microphone that you can come back to and you can listen to and reset your, your brain and your ears every time. And speaking of reference again, it all comes down to the microphone, of course. Today, it's all about that. We don't know what a rocket launch sounds like. We've never been very, very close. Nobody has been close to a rocket launch. We don't know how much distortion do we have in the air, how much, how much level are there uh, around it. But if we place a microphone, a reference microphone, in not very close because it will burn, probably, but um, at a few hundred meters, yards, um, we can record the rocket launch. Nobody knows what it sounds like on Mars. We have atmosphere on Mars, so we, there must be sound. So NASA, they bought a couple of DPA mics, and then they put, them on, put one of them on the rover and, uh, and sent that to Mars, um, because then they have sound there. Then they have a reference. They have a flat frequency response. 
when you are recording something, you guys, you know what this is, don't you? Yeah? Um, not every session I do, they recognize the room. Um, but we don't know what it sounds like up there because we, maybe someone has been up there, but we know what the room sounds like when we are standing there. We know what the orchestra sounds like. Um, and if we can pick that up, if we can pick up the sound of the room and play it back and feel that we were in the room, then we know that the microphones, they are capable of telling the truth or giving us a, 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 a clear picture, uh, or true picture of, uh, of, the, uh, of the room. So when these guys, now back to the story about DPA and, uh, and Boylan Care, when these guys, they were placing these microphones in concert halls around the world, it was because you wanted to pick up the room, you wanted to pick up the orchestra and the choir exactly as it sounded. You didn't want the microphone to be hanging up there and having a, um, a, um, a te texture or a color to the sound. All the texture, all the color, all the, the, um, the, the nuances, the dynamics, everything was in the orchestra, not in the microphone, not in the recording channel. The microphone in those situations should be as transparent as the cable should not color the sound. So these microphones, they became very popular around the world for that reason. Input equals output. Um, but our customers back in the days, they asked, can we have these fine pressure microphones, omni microphones, can we have them in a form factor, the same form factor, the, the pencil mic, uh, form factor and with the same sound but directional. So the engineers, they went back and they started to do directional microphones from the same principles as the um, pressure microphone, the omni microphones. Boylan Care days, the engineers, they were told by Boylan Care that you should not spend time on this. This is toys. This is not real microphones. Real microphones are pressure microphones. But if you can make, the, the Boylan Care told the engineer, if you can make a pressure uh, gradient microphone, a, a cardioid microphone, that has the same sound, the same qualities on axis and off axis as the Omni microphone, then you have my blessing to go on with the project. So the engineer, he made this, the, uh, the, uh, the cardioid microphone, the 4011, and presented that to Boylan Care. And they listened to it and they said, okay, you have my blessing, you can go on with the project. So they kept going with directional microphones. Later on, they made uh, wide cardioid microphones. They, later on, we made shotgun, shotgun microphones. It's open. Sh maybe that's why we had feedback. So they made directional microphones that could, um, that could stand the beating, that could pick up the sound as, um, as transparent um, as the Omni microphones. I'll come back to that later, why that is such a big deal. But mainly it's because Omni microphones are pretty easy to make, but directional microphones are really, really difficult to make if you want to have the same qualities around the microphone as you have on a pressure microphone. Fast forward 10 years, our customers at DPA Microphones, they asked, can you make the same microphone, but now smaller? Really small. Some of the other fine microphone manufacturers in the world, they have smaller microphones. Why don't DPA have smaller microphones? So the, uh, the guys from DPA, they went around the world and they interviewed a lot of different engineers and, and, and talked to them to see if, if we could make a working relationship with some. Um, it turned out that the best company for doing that was not uh, far away. It was actually just 100 kilometers away from, from the headquarters. It was a company that were making hearing aids. Not hearing aids, but parts for the hearing aid industry. They were making switches, connectors, small plastic parts. They were experts in making really, really small items 
um, and working on the microscopes. So with the technology of the measurement microphone, the pressure microphones, combined with the skills of making really small components, they made a fantastic microphone that's um, the 4060 as we know it today. It's a, a small omni microphone. Looks like this. Yeah, there it is. We have a lot of hands-on um, processes and a lot of measurements on these microphones. These microphones, the 4060s, they uh, became very popular. And we had a foot in the door in the classical uh, scene um, because we had these microphones hanging over the orchestra in many, many concert halls. So introducing these fine microphones to the classical scene, putting them on the instrument in positions where we never had a microphone uh, before. That was a revolution. Nobody heard, have ever heard what, what it sounds like in there on a, uh, on a violin. You can, cannot pick it up unless you have a very small, very precise microphone. Um, microphones this close to the instrument was, um, was um, normally a little more bulky. They were attached with a big uh, holder and it was uh, um, in the way of the, of the violin player. And if you have a violin that costs more than 10 houses, uh, you, uh, you are very, very particular about what you put on the, on the violin. So putting on these miniature microphones on, on the violins was a, um, was a big step up. But speaking of voice, Back to the voice. The voice is a very, very uh, complex um, instrument. It holds these uh, uh, frequencies, but all the fine details in the voice, if it's not picked up correctly by the microphone, we will lose speech intelligibility. So adding these microphones into the, the, um, the film industry became a big thing. We had miniature microphones in the film industry before, um, but um, with this introduction of measurement microphones in the, in the film industry, um, it became another revolution. It sewed in the um, T-shirt the here, and it was evident for the guy that made the, these, um, this, this, this is a Luc Besson movie, it's called Lucy. The guy that made that um, was very keen on the microphones placed on the actor should sound the same as microphones outside. Like he had uh, boom microphones and uh, plant microphones around on the film set, and he wanted microphones that sounded the same um, no matter where he put the microphone. So consistency between the microphones was a very, is a very big thing for these um, film guys. When we are making musical instruments and we are m using pressure microphones in a, something as um, delicate or uh, complex as a grand piano, um, and we can make that sound as a grand piano, then we kind of know that we have a good microphone position and we have a good microphone. A grand piano is maybe one of the more complex instruments that we have, most complex instruments. It has a very wide frequency range and it has a very high dynamic range, but it also has a very fast transient response. I see it as, and that's just inside my head, I see it like a three-dimensional picture where we have the frequency range on this side and the dynamic range this way, and then the, the fastness, the speed, the transients going the other way. A pipe organ has more low end, a piccolo flute has more high end, but it doesn't have both in the same instrument. So, miking up a grand piano is really complex. As it is with a drum kit, it's really complex as well. We have a lot of low end, we have a lot of high end, we have a lot of transients in a drum kit. <coughs> so, placing these microphones in a drum kit, um, would prove the point, would prove that the microphones are capable of handling both 
the dynamics, the frequency response, and of course the transients. So this is what I did. We did a drum session, a, um, a um, video about how to mic drums with miniature microphones. I placed a microphone here and one here. One in the uh, triangle between the snare, the rack tom, and the hi-hat. And the other one in the triangle between the floor tom, the kick drum, and the snare drum. The point was that the two microphones have exactly the same distance to the snare. Because the microphones are very precise, they have the same output, they have the same sensitivity, um, I know that if the time um, is correct between the two microphones, if they have the same distance to the snare, they will arrive, the snare drum sound will arrive at the same time to both microphones. And they will be in level, they will be right in the middle of the mix. So this is what I did, I recorded the drum kit like this. Unfortunately, it was only like 20 seconds, so this little demonstration is cut up in three, where we have the stereo and we have um, one mono and one mono, and then stereo at the end again. Um, so um, fasten your seatbelts and listen to what miniature microphones, pressure microphones, are capable of on a drum kit. Just two mics placed in that position. You would hear, those of you sitting over here, you would hear probably mostly the, uh, the kick drum over here. You can't hear that side so, go so good. Um, and of course, you would have more kick drum on, on one side because it's placed like that. But you have a pretty good picture of the entire drum kit just with those two mics. And this is just to prove how much low end and how much precision, how much details you can have in a, a five millimeter capsule. Doesn't need to be a huge capsule to capture huge sounds or low end. We hear that a lot, that you need a big microphone to capture low end, which is not true. Size does not matter, no matter what you heard outside. Does not matter, we can have very, very um, low end uh, on a very small capsule. Just imagine your eardrums, like how big is that? Is that two, three millimeters? And you can hear low end with the, with the eardrum. So let's kill that myth today that big microphones produce low end. <laughs> 